the Lord. Good evening, everybody, and good to have you with us. This is a house of miracles, uh, a house of healing, house of deliverance, house of prayer, house of worship. Those are the things that we do and the things we believe in. Uh, I am Pastor Bill Emmons. This is Covenant Faith Center, CFC Ministries International, and uh, this is our Tuesday Night Live Bible study. So we encourage you to Spend the next hour with us. I believe it will not be boring for you uh, if you'll open your heart and uh, listen and maybe take some notes. You know, that's what we do in a Bible study. And uh, I believe you'll learn something and I believe you'll be encouraged and blessed by the time we're done. And so we're going to go ahead and get into it. Uh, let's see if I've got anything else I have to do here. I've got all the microphones on. Uh, sound is good. 
All right. I think we are ready to go. <clears throat> We've been in a series here on Tuesday nights called uh, The Covenant Series. And uh, I, I always have to distinguish this uh, from my teaching on the blood covenant. The blood covenant is uh, explaining what a blood covenant is, how it operates um, and functions in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, giving the history of it, uh, you know, all the details of how it works. And then, of course, the scriptures that uh, show us it at work, Old and New Testament. This series is dealing more with God's dealing with his covenant people and with the response, the actions of covenant people. And so we're looking at things from a little different perspective in this particular series. So if you're keeping notes, this is part 15. We're adjusting our Instagram family. <clears throat> are they on? Okay, welcome Instagram, welcome Facebook family. And all of you that are on different social media platforms, welcome. Uh, we're um, on 16 different social media platforms and reaching about 40,000, uh, roughly 40,000 homes per week. And uh, we're glad to have you with us. And I have to do some re repeat in the sense of uh, doing a, a little bit of recap from the last session for those that um, are new and we, we're getting new people all the time. Uh, I shared Sunday, I got a, a um, message from a pastor in Kenya uh, this past week and shared uh, with us that him and his congregation watch our programs and have really been blessed and, uh, you know, really uh, have learned and grown. And, and I appreciate that. That's an encouragement to me. We're, we're reaching somebody. <laughs> and we've been invited, if we ever get over to Kenya, to uh, contact them for an opportunity to come and minister in their church. All right. So let me give you a little bit of a uh, recap. Last week, we talked about the question of why the law. And there was two reasons for the law. Uh, one, to reveal to Israel after leaving Egypt the details of their side of the covenant that God made with Abraham. <clears throat> a blood covenant does not stop when the person that was originally the, uh, the, the first party or the, the uh, person the covenant was made with. A yeah, blood covenant goes from generation to generation. And the descendants of the covenant partners by covenant are obligated to fulfill any unfulfilled promises and any promises that were made that were ongoing to fulfill those promises. That's their obligation. And so we needed to, we need to look at the fact that Israel, after spending 430 years in Egypt and, and a chunk of that as slaves to, to Egypt, uh, they had uh, potentially not been fulfilling their side of the covenant, uh, it was all dependent upon the promises God made to Abraham. But there came a point in the wilderness after they crossed over uh, the Red Sea that uh, God finally, he kept blessing them, but there came a point where they needed to understand what it meant to be in covenant, in this case with the creator of the universe, what their responsibilities, obligations were, but also what God would do for them because the, they kept the promises, the, the covenant promises. And so uh, then we, we go to the law being the teacher. Uh, they couldn't hear the Holy Spirit because they weren't born again the Spirit filled. So trying to get uh, insight, understanding, revelation uh, without being born again, um, you know, is just <laughs> next to impossible. Um, but... God wanted them to see and understand what the covenant was for, what the law was, what sin was. And uh, I listed five things here in my notes. Uh, the law was given to reveal, and you can read this in Galatians 3, verses 24 through 29. The law was given to reveal what sin is, our inability to overcome sin 
on our own, our unrighteousness or lack of standing with God, our inability to make ourselves righteous or to do something in our natural flesh that would give us right standing with God, and um, our need for righteousness so that we can stand in the presence of God. And then we talked about uh, the law and the prophets uh, reveal uh, the true way to righteousness. And this is referenced in Romans chapter 3, verses 20 through 28. And so there's seven things there that came out of the law and the prophets uh, that we read in Romans chapter 3 there. Uh, that the righteousness of God is by faith of and in Jesus Christ. We use the faith of Jesus when he said to have the faith of God. Well, that's the faith he was operating in. And if, and if he could operate in it and he tells us to have that faith, then we can operate in it. But it was the, the starting point was faith in what Jesus did. Because what he did for us, he did by faith. And we, we need to operate in that faith that was a faith that will never quit, never give up, uh, wouldn't faint away from the pressures, would do what needed to be done. And, and I mean, that's a mountain moving kind of faith. And Jesus moved some mighty mountains uh, uh, of obstacles in his life. So the second thing is that we are justified or made given right standing with God freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so we need to understand that our right standing with God is not a matter of anything we can do except receive Jesus as Lord because he paid the price. He gave us the ability to once again become righteous in the sight and in the presence of God. Number three that God uh, made Jesus a propitiation, which simply means a substitute sacrifice, that he would be punished instead of the lamb being slain and the blood being spilled. Jesus would take the place because he's the true sacrifice and he would pay the price for our sins. That's the propitiation uh, for our sins. And it was uh, through faith in his blood. In other words, he spilled his blood uh, the life is in the blood. He poured out his life for us. And it's through the blood we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, the Bible declares. Number four, that through Jesus, we have remission of sins. Remission of sins means uh, total forgiveness, wiped out like they never existed. Uh, I don't care how bad of a sinner you are or might have been, when you make Jesus Lord of your life, that part of your life is wiped out. It's gone. God does not remember your sins. The Bible said he'll, ne he'll not remember your sins. He'll remove them as far as the east is from the west. When you come to God and you, you need help, he won't find fault with you. He won't say, well, remember what you did. Remember what you said. He won't do that. So remission of sins is important because that's just a clear, uh, how can I say it? it it's a, a clean slate. All right, we start over. All right, um, that God, number five, that God is just and a justifier. Now, that statement is really important. When you read it in context, uh, it, it makes sense, but we don't get it sometimes. He is just. What does that mean? He will do the right thing all the time. He doesn't change. He doesn't do one thing for someone and then something totally different for somebody else. He's not going to give you right standing because you were a good person. He's not going to give you access into his throne room in the heavenly holy of holies uh, because you were you helped the poor, uh, you gave gifts to people, you never cussed. You know, I mean, there's a lot of good people out there that they're not born again, but they they do the right things. It's the Bible talks about those who who really do the law and don't even know what the law is. But we're not justified by the law. We're justified by faith. So uh, God is the just, he is just, and he is the justifier. In other words, 
he justifies us. And how does that happen? Through Jesus' sacrifice as our substitute. That makes us justified. One person years ago I heard him say about being justified is just as if I'd never sinned. Justified, justified. All right. Number six, the law alone cannot accomplish any of this. And this, again, remember the law and the prophets are, are teaching us this in the Old Testament, taught the Old Testament people, the, the people of God, Israel. If they can't do it on their own. There's, there's nothing they can do to cleanse themselves and, and do away with their sin and the punishment uh, because he's just and sin must be punished. And it's not that God wants that. He never implemented that for mankind to live in that. But when sin came in, the nature of the devil took charge and God had to have a way to deal with that so that uh, people that were, you know, hell raisers, if I can say that, um, wouldn't, you know, somehow manage to find their way into heaven and start wreaking havoc there. And so God doesn't allow that stuff in heaven. So he has to make a way for us to be cleansed of all that, changed, our nature has to change. We go from being dead spiritually. When you get born again, you become alive spiritually. What's, what is that? That's the reverse of what happened to Adam. He was created alive to God, and then he sinned and died spiritually. And that's why we need something that will give us that, that same thing that Adam lost. It will give it back to us, that we can once again have the God connection and be alive unto God. And that's what Jesus provided for us. And number seven, uh, the only, uh, that only the law of faith in what Jesus did as our substitute could give us that experience and that condition. Amen. All right. Now, when God made promises to Abraham, we read this and quoted it many times. God made promises to Abraham and then swore by himself that he would keep those promises because there was nothing greater for him to swear by. So we can have confidence. We can, we can declare the promises of God for us personally. Take them personal because God swore by himself he would keep his promises. Well, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament tells us that the promises were not just to Israel, not just to the bloodline descendants of Abraham, but to those who are uh, of the faith of Abraham. What does that mean? Well, Abraham believed what he could not see because God promised it. He put his trust and his confidence in God's promise to him. And he acted on that as if it was already done. In fact, in the New Testament, there's one scripture that says that he was like God whom, in whom he believed, who spoke of things that be not as though they were or as if they had already manifested. God does that. He, he talked about everything, the history of mankind, from the very beginning, what was going to happen, when it was going to happen, and, you know, just so many things. And none of it had happened yet, but that's how faith speaks. And Abraham did that. And we see many others in the Bible. You ought to read the book of Hebrew, uh, chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, that's, a lot of people call that the um, Faith's Hall of Fame. And you read about a whole lot of people that walked in that kind of faith. They just trusted God. They weren't allowed, they didn't allow themselves to be moved by what they felt, by what they saw, by what they heard, but only by what God had said and acted on that with the confidence God would keep his promises. Now, the, when we talk about the promises, there's, uh, when, we, when, when God gives a word to us, uh, a prophetic word, encouraging word, a scripture promise, there's always two aspects to that. There's the natural side of it, the physical side, the, the side where we live in this physical body and we are a recipient of a promise. Uh, but then there's the spiritual side of it. And the spiritual side of it has to do with the work of Jesus. We can have the promise of Abraham, even though we may not be by the blood of Abraham, if we operate in the same kind of faith. And it's Jesus that gives us the ability to do that. It's the word. You know, that's what he said. He says the, the, that the word 
uh, you know, the anointing is on the word. When the, the word goes forth, the anointing goes forth. And uh, I mean, there's so many things. I could go a lot of different directions right now, but uh, it's through what Jesus did as our example so that we could walk in that. I want to go to Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to start at verse 16. Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. <clears throat> verse 17. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the anointed one, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Now, it talks like the promise was a singular thing. Now, there's a lot of promises God made to Abraham, but there was the promise, the prime promise. And that promise was that from the loins of Abraham, there would come a Messiah, a Redeemer, a Savior, and that through him, that our lives would be changed. We could reconnect with God. We would go from, be born from death to life and take again, like Adam had, the nature of God, the life of God, the communication with God. And that, and so he's making the promises, or singularly the promise of redemption, to Jesus himself. That's who he's talking to. But because we are the body of Christ, all that Jesus got, we got. So we receive, we receive the benefits of all that promise, the covenant promises, Old Testament, and of course, then in the New Testament. We are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, and we are also heirs of the promises of Abraham. That's a pretty good combination. All right. We, um, let's see. God's desire. Um, let's see. Have I finished that reading yeah. that yet? Yeah. yeah. You turn the page. Okay. So we'll go to Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 9. Then said he, let's talk about Jesus. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. What's that mean? Jesus, the Bible declares to us, fulfilled the law perfectly. When he hung on the cross and he stated, it is finished, he's talking about that old covenant. It's done. It's fulfilled. Everything God promised came to pass in him. But he established a new covenant with better promises. All right. Verse uh, 10, by the which will we, I'm sorry, by the which will we are sanctified or set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. You know, if you're living by the law, the things you're doing don't take away sin. And that's frustrating. That's why we have to depend upon what Jesus did as our substitute. But this, verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. By the way, that was a seat of royalty. That was a seat of power uh, in the era of kings and queens. Uh, there was usually an advisor, a, an appointed person that sat to the right of the king. And he was not only the king's mouthpiece, but he was also the king's enforcer. He was the one who had, would advise the king on certain things and then be responsible for seeing to it that it got done. It's a place of great power. Well, here it said Jesus after he had offered himself as the one final sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 13, from henceforth, expecting this, expecting, I'm sorry, 
till his enemies be made his footstool. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified or set apart. Verse 15, Wherefore, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, Verse it's on still verse 16, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sin and iniquities will I remember no more. Now putting it in their hearts and in their minds, when you get born again, the nature of God comes back into you. Remember Adam lost it, we got it back through Jesus. When the nature of God comes into us, then the Holy Spirit begins to minister to us and the, the, uh, you know, the fulfillment of all the requirements of the law become fulfilled because of Jesus, what he did, not because of what we've done. And so the, we do things, we live as a Christian and you serve God and you spend time in the word and in time pray, spend time praying, fellowshipping with the Father and so forth. What happens is you're, you're constantly renewing your mind till you begin to think the way God thinks. Your uh, soul, which is your mind, will, and emotions begin to be renewed through the word, the washing of the water of the word of God. It says to receive with meekness and grafted words, which has the power to save your soul or change your mind, will, and emotions. All right. So uh, in this process, God's laws are being uh, written, if you, if you can take the verbiage he said, written on our hearts. What does that mean? It means the nature of God begins to manifest. We begin to do things. I'd like to use the word by instinct, but it's, it's really by the spirit. Mm -hmm. When you're born again, you have a recreated human spirit, and that's in contact with God. And sometimes your spirit will speak to you, and you won't even realize that it was speaking. Uh, the, 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 the hunch, the impression, mm -hmm. uh, that statement where you say, well, I don't know, something told me, I just felt impressed. Your spirit is speaking to you when you're born again. Now, when you're not born again, your spirit is dead. The only thing it can do is talk to you about sin <laughs> and death. But when you're born again, your spirit comes alive with the nature of God. And so that process of the new birth and the uh, renewing of your mind and your soul is the process of God's law being written in your heart. And it's not the legalistic like it was in the Old Testament because Jesus said all the law is fulfilled in, in two things. Love God with all your heart, your mind, your body, your soul, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, in these two things, all the law is fulfilled. So, I mean, he really breaks it down into very simple things for us to understand. When we get the nature of God, the nature of God is love. I had shared a few weeks ago about the nature of God. God is love. I heard some a preacher just this past week uh, kind of make a derogatory comment about uh, us going around saying God is love. And he said, you know, people just think because God loves that, uh, you know, everybody can do anything they want to do and God will love them. And he said, no, God can hate things too. And he can hate people for their evilness. And, but the fact is, if you look at what the word says, for God so loved the world. He loved them before they were born again, before they were changed. He, if you're not born again today, he loves you. He, he doesn't love your sin. He hates that sin. And he hates it because it destroys you and it dooms you to eternal hell. That's why he hates sin. But God loves you and he's doing everything that he can do to bring you into that place of being born again so that you can walk in the love of God, the nature of God, have eternal life, sins forgiven and cleansed like they never happened. And when you die or the rapture takes place, you're going to be stepping over into heaven and live forever. So, you know, it's um, when we start, you know, trying to excuse, you know, uh, people's evil actions and sins out there, and, and uh, well, God loves them, so, you know, God will, 
uh, he'll just accept them because he loves them. Well, again, there's two sides to that. And, and uh, sin destroys. The wages of sin is death. So if you choose to live continually in sin all your life, it will produce that spiritual death and you will be separated from God for eternity. But God still loves you. He doesn't want to see anybody go to hell. So we've got to understand God does not hate you. And, and you know, you may be doing some of the most evil things. He hates the evil because that's the nature of Satan working in you. But he still loves you and wants you to be saved. All right, let's move on. Um, verse 17 says, And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Well, God has memory failure when it comes to your sins once you're born again. In Jeremiah 31, verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made when their fathers uh, made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. See how God speaks like a father talking about his children. Mm -hmm. I took them by the hand and I led them out. And we know that's true because we know the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud was literally the presence of God leading Israel. And so God was on the scene. They didn't understand covenant yet. They apparently had not been taught for generations. And, uh, well, at least, it, you know, the last generation we knew about are the ones that went into Egypt. 430 years they came out. And that was four generations later. So God was having to take them by the hand and, and like children, you know, teach them uh, what to do, what not to do. And finally, the law was given so they would understand how they could walk in the presence of God and the blessings of God. All right, so verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this, this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, I will remember their sin no more. So we've got clear statements here about what God feels, uh, the fact that God, you know, did these things like a father guiding Israel, even when they rebelled, even when they broke the law, which didn't really exist yet. Uh, but they, they uh, uh, how can I say, they sinned. <laughs> but that's why they needed the law to understand what they were doing. All right. Um, one of the questions that when you start studying this whole, um, well, how do I say it? The whole, uh, well, just, you know, this, this episode, I could say, from Egypt to the promised land, all right? There were things along the way that God would eventually tell Israel, all right, now do this and do it exactly as I tell you. And there were reasons for that. Uh, when, when they came out of Egypt, they were supposed to march across that desert. I've, been, I've heard people say that's about a seven-day trip. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I trust people that have said that. Uh, so about a seven-day trip, and yet uh, before they were able to cross into the Promised Land, it was actually 40 years because of their rebellion, their lack of trust. The rebellion was because they did not trust God. Because they didn't trust what God said, then they didn't want to do what God told them to do. That's how rebellion kind of gets started. And uh, it came down to two guys, Joshua and Caleb, who did trust God. And so the whole generation that got to uh, the place where they were supposed to go into the promised land and didn't, 
that generation had to die. And, and from that came everybody from 20 years on down survived that next 40 years. And with Joshua and Caleb came into the promised land. They decided they were going to do what God said to do because that was what was best at, for Israel. And that would eventually bring forth the promises that God made to Abraham for his descendants. Their obedience would allow that to happen. All right, so one of the questions that comes up is, why, what, why, do, why did they need to build a temple? I mean, if God could be there, uh, you know, with um, <laughs> Abraham goes up on the mountain and there's a burning bush that doesn't burn up and God can speak to him. Moses goes on the mountain, God speaks to him, and there's another burning bush. And, uh, you know, God is capable of speaking. The problem is, if it, you're not born again, you're not capable of hearing. You may hear something. And I, I think it's interesting when you look at uh, Moses, when uh, God speaks to him, it tells us the people heard thunder. They didn't hear the voice of God. Only Moses heard the voice of God. Why? Because he was the one that was in, in obedience to God and therefore was tuned in to what God had to say. All right, so uh, the temple, the, the real purpose of the temple is multifaceted, but the core purpose is that God wanted to dwell with his people. That's been the heart of God all along. He wanted to dwell with his creation, his people. Mankind was created in the image of God, and, and God made man to be a fellow shipper, if I can say it that way, somebody that God could fellowship with. Mankind was the only creature that God ever made that was so much like God that God could sit down and fellowship with him. And so God is trying from the, from the time of Adam and the, and the fall of Adam and Eve, God was trying to get mankind back to a place where God could sit in their presence and they wouldn't be destroyed because of the sin nature in them. Well, the temple was, was what would do that. That would allow God to be in their presence and bless them and help them and, and but through the high priest, give them counsel and direction and so forth. Uh, they couldn't, they still couldn't see him physically face to face because death was in them and uh, the, the glory of God, it destroys death when it comes in its presence. So that wouldn't have been too good. All right. Um, God could not dwell in Israel in the sense of in the people like we're born again. God dwells in us. But he couldn't do that, and he can't do it today to a non-born again person. You're not born again. If you've never made Jesus Lord according to the word of God, and you say, well, I believe, I'm a Christian, and, uh, <laughs> you're not, and you never got born again, a lot of people believe. Even the devils believe, and they tremble. That's not enough to believe in the Bible. You've got to make Jesus Lord. You say, how do I do that? Well, the Bible says, if you'll believe in your heart, that's a choice you have to make. That God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth, Jesus as Lord, you shall be saved. Now, there's an aspect of this process, and that is repentance. Now, repentance doesn't mean going and confessing every sin you ever committed, crying and leaving tear stains on the altar. No. Repentance means to make a decision to turn and go the opposite direction of that you from what you've been going, from sin to life, all right? So uh, because Israel, the people of Israel were not born again, God, God could not dwell in them like he can dwell in us because they had not yet received eternal life. They have not yet received forgiveness of sin and they were spiritually dead, all right? God had to deal with man, uh, or men, I should say it that way. God had to deal with men through the senses, and by that, because they weren't spiritually alive, God had to have ways to do that in the temple, and the structure, the design of the temple, all of them had something to reveal to Israel, and I won't get into that tonight. Exodus 25, verse 8 says, Let them make me a sanctuary, so that I may dwell among them. 
The tabernacle was to be a physical illustration of what God had, um, let's see, of what God, uh, what had to be done so man could have right standing with God to be able to stand in the very presence of God. Man in his unborn again state cannot stand in the presence of God. So God gave a very specific set of instructions regarding the building of the temple. Every part of the temple reveals something important. Exodus 25 verse 2 says, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of, er, um, of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. Now, th that's, that, tell, that reveals something about giving to me. When we give, in the New Testament, it says not under pressure, not under compulsion. We give willingly. And that's what it says back here. God is looking for the willing heart. So he's giving instructions to Israel. It's time to build this temple. It's going to take some money. It's going to take some silver, some gold, some wood, some, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of parts to this thing. And he says, tell them to bring an offering for the temple, to build a temple. And, uh, but only the ones that are willing to do it. And, you know, that, again, like I said, that really, when I read that, and I've read it before, but sometimes you read something over time and, and you didn't get all there was to get out of it. And I read that and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me highlight that word willingly. Because each person that gave needed to be a willing giver. When you give tithes and you give offerings today to support a ministry like ours, for example, or your home church, uh, you're supposed to be, do it willingly, not grudgingly, not like, oh, you know, holding on to it, you know. No, you give willingly. Why? Because it does nothing but bless us. When we sow a seed, it's like an investment. You invest in something, but the gospel, the word of God, the things of God will never let you down. Where you invest in the stock market, you can get, get some letdowns. So we invest in the kingdom of God through our tithes and our offerings. We do it willingly, not just for the gain. A lot of people think all you guys, that's all you care about is the gain, the, uh, you know, the harvest, you want to get a return. Well, sure, that's the promise of God. So if God promised it, yeah, I want it. But I don't give just so I can get a, a harvest. I, there's times I need to do that, but that's not my purpose in giving generally. My purpose is giving is worship. When we give, we worship God. And you do that willingly. You don't worship God begrudgingly. You worship God willingly. And so giving is, is another aspect of worship. So... And, and one of the notes that I put down here, that the people had to want God's presence in their midst. That's why he says, do it, only take it from people that are willing to give. Why? Because they're the ones that really want God's presence. Today, how bad do you want the presence of God in your life? Think about it, you know. God's not going to come into your life without your permission. He's not going to force you to get saved and go to heaven. He's not going to pressure you to do anything. The Holy Spirit will nudge you a lot over the years, but God's not going to force you to do any of that. It's got to be willingly. All right. The, the temple was patterned after, the Bible declares, the tabernacle in heaven. So Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 says, Let them make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. He's speaking about the heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly temple. Well, what is that? Well, if you look at the earthly one, it tells you. The mercy seat is the seat of God. The high priest, and he was the only one that could go into the holy of holies, where the mercy seat was. And, and even that, he had before he could go in there, he had to go through a process of washing and cleansing to, to symbolically wash away his sin and go in there based upon the, the um, Old Testament, the covenant 
uh, requirements. And only after he had done all that is he allowed to even go into the presence of God. And again, he was the only one that could do that, the high priest. See? Nobody else could do that. If they did, they dropped dead. Why? At the very least, they had to be a priest, the high priest, and they had to go through all that ceremony to cleanse themselves before they go in. If somebody just tried to walk in there and into the presence of God, they couldn't do it. They didn't, they didn't cleanse themselves symbolically from the lifestyle that they have. All right, tried to make that as simple as possible to understand. Um, all right, so uh, in Hebrews chapter 8, and we're getting short on time here, we're doing good. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So here he clearly states to the Hebrews who were supposed to understand these things, these were the Jews, uh, that there is a heavenly sanctuary. And we can go back and read the scriptures where God gives Moses, um, what, well, later on, you know, <laughs> God gives specific instructions. And those instructions were so detailed that anybody could build that once they knew exactly what the instructions were. There's no if, ands, or buts. There's no shortcuts. There's no, well, if this doesn't quite work, we'll, you know, if we run out of this kind of thing, we'll, I mean, there were badger skins and goat skins and purple cloth. And I mean, there, there were layer after layer after layer uh, of that, um, not only the temple itself and the outer walls that hid that beauty of, uh, of the presence of God, but even in that curtain that separated from the holy place from the holy of holies, that was multi-layered. And uh, each layer actually represented something, revealed something about the nature of God. And it was up to the priest to take that revelation, that knowledge that God was revealing in the building of this temple and turn around and begin to let people know about the purity of God, the royalty of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the evilness of sin. All that symbolically represented in the temple. All right, so here... We have a confirmation in the New Testament that there was a temple or is a temple in heaven and that the physical one, of course, was designed and built as a, 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 a replication of that one in heaven. For every high priest, verse 3, is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man, Jesus, have somewhat also to offer. For if he were... On earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example of and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee on the mount, or in the mount. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. We're still talking about Jesus here. By how much also he, Jesus, is the mediator of a better covenant. That's the new covenant. Which was established upon better promises. So we have, and I've taken you through a quick, uh, a quick description of the temple. I didn't, I didn't get into all the details. I might do some of that. I don't want to get boring on you, uh, but it might be good for you to next week learn a little bit about the elements used in the temple construction and what they represented. And I'll try, if I do that, I'll try to do it um, in, not in a boring fashion, but in a way that you'll, you'll get blessed by it. So we'll see how Holy Spirit directs me for next week. But I wanted you to understand that there is a very real heaven there is a very real uh, place, the throne of God, where God sits. That's the heavenly holy of holies. And when Jesus went up to heaven with his own blood and sprinkled all the utensils of worship, the Bible tells us this, 
and cleanses everything before he actually goes in the presence of God. And then he doesn't sit down. He doesn't, he's, he's a high priest at that point. And he offers himself as the final sacrifice. God accepts him. And then Jesus is set down at the right hand of the Father. And he's there making intercession for us. Talking to God on our behalf. Well, God didn't have to be argued into anything. But I think a lot of what Jesus does is say, Oh, you see what so-and-so did? Now, what a blessing. Why, why, don't you, why don't you give him a little bit more? Why don't you bless him a little bit more, you know? I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming that. I don't know what all Jesus does, but it says to make intercession for us. So he's standing in for us. Hallelujah. All right. I am, uh, well, we're already, we're, we're not fully out of time, but we're close enough. <laughs> I trust you got something out of this and that you were encouraged and blessed by it. Uh, and and I, I, I wanted to get into the next step of what is the tabernacle and I'm not going to do it. That's, that's really where I'm going next week. So we'll see how we get both talking about the old temple or actually the, the one that uh, Moses uh, built and the current temple. What is the current temple? A lot of you that are born again, you already know, but I want to talk about that some more because you need to, you need to be refreshed in that and be woke up <laughs> to who you are, what you are. Yeah. And I don't want to give away everything, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Well, good to have you with us tonight. Uh, I, I know you got blessed. I know you learned something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I try not to just spend all my time just reading scripture, uh, but to explain as we go, to give you uh, my narration, uh, what I, my insight that I might have, uh, given over years of time, uh, I've been reading the Bible and and uh, the thing and studying the things of God since I was a kid. Uh, I used to go to summer camp, and there's always a preacher there uh, trying to encourage us, you know, to do things that affect the rest of our lives. And of course, getting born again, and spirit filled, were the main things. But we had one preacher that came two years in a row, and uh, he talked about reading the Bible through. And uh, he gave us the, you know, the ways to do that so we don't get, fall asleep every time we, we read. But um, he said, I'm going to uh, ask you to read the Bible through between now and next year's camp. And he says, next year we're going to uh, see, we're going to ask for a raise of hands. How many of you uh, truly read the Bible through? And uh, I was one that did. And, and the percentage was, was not all that great. I would say probably no more than 10 or 15% of the kids that were there the year before read the Bible through. But that got me started on reading the Bible through. And then later on, when Pastor Mary and I got married, we, the church we attended, there was an evangelist that would come through every year, uh, Phil Green. Is that right, Mary? That's Phil Green, right? Yeah, I, I memorized that. <laughs> Phil Green would come with big old charts, eight foot long charts. There's a couple of times I was able to help him with them. And uh, four foot, you know, top to bottom, about eight foot. I could be wrong, eight foot. It could have been six foot. I don't know. Big. And he would make diagrams and charts and show us how this connects and how that connects and what this means. And and uh, he got us reading the Bible through. And we would buy a very inexpensive Bible and cut it into exact 12 sections, that the exact number of pages for each section, and make cardboard covers with... Um, what was that paper that you that you pull the backing off and stick to it? You remember the name of it? Anyway, we would cover it with that paper, and and then each month we'd start on you know day one of the month, and we'd open up and we we were to read so many pages each day. By the end of the year, we will have read the Bible through. So we we did that, and then on my own study, just uh, there's times I just decided, well, this year I'm going to go ahead and read through again and uh, start at, um, uh, uh, you know, read a portion in the Old Testament, a portion in the New Testament. And because uh, there's some in the Old Testament that's really hard to read. <laughs> you need to kind of balance it with the New Testament. But uh, I've done that a number of times over the years. And boy, I'll tell you what, you'd be surprised how much you get out of that. 
And it, that's part of the renewing of the mind. Amen. Well, I'm going to stop. All right. So listen, we love you guys. And uh, we encourage you to be prepared uh, Thursday for Thursday's word. Always, I always have a good word that God gives me to encourage you and kind of give you a booster shot for finishing the week strong. So it's sometime on Thursday afternoon. I, I never have the exact time because that Thursday is one of those days I've got a number of things to get done. And um, I, I have to kind of figure out my schedule so that I can do that on Thursdays. But uh, we'll give you a 20 minute exhortation and it'll bless you. So when you get the notice, and I hope you click the notification button uh, so that you can be notified when we come on, so you can get that. By the way, and since I got a minute or two left here, let me ask you to do something for me. Uh, we've been hovering around the same number of views per week, and it's, like I said, uh, it's, it's um, in that range of almost 40,000 sometimes, and sometimes over, sometimes under. But uh, my goal is 50,000 views per week. And uh, that's not a huge goal, but it's a goal. And when we get that finally, and when that becomes our average, then we move up to 75. And we're going to keep on growing. But you can help us. And the way you do that is you click the like button. You click the share button. Uh, follow button, if there is one, depending on which social media platform you're watching or listening on. The... the um, uh, what was it? Uh, like, share, follow, subscribe. Like YouTube is the subscribe button and the notification button so you can be notified. And then leave a short comment. You don't have to get all preachy or anything. It's just some things, you know, say praise the Lord or I was watching or I was listening or something. The reason for all that, all of these things are by the algorithms that run the, the social media platforms, it identifies those activities. And the more activity we get, the more the algorithm moves in our favor, favor to promote our programming, which will in turn reach more people. And your part in the sharing, when you click the share button, uh, that's part of how you can help us reach more people as well. So do that if you would. And uh, then if you would leave us a comment, be nice about it. <laughs> and uh, we will see you on Thursday. God bless.